So good morning, everyone. I'm just going to wait for a couple of minutes. My name is Patrick Matthews. I'm a lecturer in the Center for Deaf Studies. And it's a school of the linguistics um, and sciences. It's actually, we have it here, school of linguistics, speech, and sciences. I'm going to sign in my own language, Irish Sign Language, and the interpreter, Pauline, will translate into English. So obviously we're going to be working through the interpreter. So you'll be able to hear what I'm saying through, through the interpreter. And if the voice, if, if it's not loud enough for you at the back, please just let me know and I'll switch the volume up from the interpreter. Okay? Is that clear? Is everyone happy with that? Can everyone hear okay? Yeah? Okay, that's perfect. I'm quite flexible with my presentation and of course we only have a very limited time so any questions that you may have please feel free to ask. The Centre for Deaf Studies was set up in 2001 and so we have our 10 year anniversary this year. And then we at start at, for, until recently we've actually offered a two year diploma but now we've changed to a four year degree. So we're in actually, our, our first cohorts of students are in their third year now of, of that four-year degree. So we haven't finished, actually completed that four-year degree program just at the moment. Yep, everyone is happy. You know, of course, to, to, for, for entry into the course, we must go through the CAO and you have 385, about 385 points for that entry. And of course, um, you must pass um, English in the honours, you know, C, the level C3, you must pass in honours. Or if, there is a, if you're a mature student, of course, you still must go through the CAO, but there's different requirements for that. I won't be asking your age here at all, so that's up to yourself. You have to decide if you're mature or if you have to go straight through from um, the, the leaving certs. So we have 20 placements within the course, and that's it. So we have quite a limited uh, amount of spaces. So really our degree program, is, the official name is Bachelor for Deaf Studies. And of course there are different th three different strands which are offered within those general deaf studies. There's the deaf study, general deaf studies, there's ISL English interpreting, which you can see in, at work at the moment through our interpreter. And then we have ISL teaching, which is Irish Sign Language teaching. So they're the three strands that we have within those four year degree. So just have a quick look at the slides there um, and, and so just for, so that you know when I'm signing then you can't obviously look at me and read the slide at the same time. It, it, it's quite different you know, from what you might be used to, a spoken language. You can listen and then you can um, read at the same time. So if you're actually physically looking at me, it's, it's, di it's different in that sense. So you can see then the deaf studies that what that offers and, and how you know you can be involved within the deaf community through social or educational areas. So just have a quick look at actually at the slides. And you know when I'm speaking about ISL, Irish Sign Language, I'll I'll explain what that means. And it, as I say, it's as you see, it's Irish Sign Language. If you're speaking about sign language, that means can be any sign language in the world from any country. And so when you see that word Irish in front of it, obviously then it means it's indigenous here to the Irish deaf community. Just so that you're clear in that way, you know, because some people can be confused that it's uh, the Irish language itself, but no, it's not. And it's very different from spoken language from, the I either, I from either the Irish language or from English. The structure and the grammar is completely different 
the ISL structure. In Northern Ireland, we ha we're, there's two languages used, sign languages. There's ISL, Irish Sign Language, and BSL, British Sign Language. Because a lot of people feel that, you know, that sign language is worldwide, that it's international, but it's not. Every own country has its own indigenous sign language. However, when you know, a deaf person meets another deaf person from a foreign country, quite often we can understand each other. We can get the gist of what, we're say of what the other person is saying or, or signing. <coughs> of course, people who use the languages, the Irish deaf community, and then people within that would be deaf and hearing people, people who are working with deaf, you know, hearing people who are working with deaf people, and professionals within that community, such as interpreters, social workers, in, in our school and our educational, some of our educational system, deaf organizations. So there's different areas in which the language is used. Of course, members of, of the deaf person's family, brothers and sisters and so on, would likewise often use ISL. You know, when we talk about the Irish deaf community, of course, we're not living in one particular area, but rather we're spread throughout Ireland, of course. It's like an invisible uh, community in that sense. But what, when we say the Irish deaf community, we, we mean we have the same aims. And of course, within that deaf community, as, an, as individuals and as a, as a community, we have deaf culture. It, we naturally have that within us. You know, people within that deaf community, some people are just working within the community, but generally when people are, you know, submersed in that community, then um, they would have deaf culture, such as deaf people and, and members of deaf family. And just to be aware that sometimes um, there will be a, what they refer to as a lag time with the interpreter, so I'll have stopped signing and the interpreter will still be talking. When you're speaking about interpreting, of course, there's different areas in which interpreter can be working, uh, whether it be in conferences, educational, on a, uh, uh, maybe at job interviews, <coughs> medical settings, and so on. So you have to see if, if it's an area that you would like to be working in, perhaps in the future, and you have to pick wh which, which area of, uh, or which setting that you would like to be working in. People would like, some people want to work with children, deaf children, uh, or with deaf adults and so on. So there are decisions you have to make when you're deciding of which course or which strand you would like to focus on. And within that deaf community, of course, the ISL, it depends. Some, for some people, it's a, it's a first language, or for others, it's a preferred language. And some people are bilingual, that they have both ISL and English uh, as equal fluence, in an equal fluency. I'm kind of jumping, you'll find I'm jumping a little bit, because it's, our time is very limited, but anything you want to know, there's no problem. And just I want you to be clear as well as to when you're applying for the course. You don't have to have any actual you know, knowledge or fluency in ISL. Before we did, there, there, was a, there was a requirement that you had to have some type of, you know, some form of sign, but at the moment, this is not the case. So with the degree program, it's not necessary. It's very open that way. You will actually learn the language as you're studying. I mean, of course, some people will be coming into the course with, with you know, sign language or with knowledge of sign language, but the, the majority will have none. So in the first two years, we, have IS, we've, we do two modules of ISL for every year. So altogether, we have ISL. It goes from one up to eight modules. For the first two years as well, everyone studies together. It's general deaf studies. And then after those two years, then it's decided as to which specialization you will go into. You know, you have to see what you would like to work in and 
concentrate on, whether it be the interpreting, the teaching, or general deaf studies if you want to work with deaf people. Because there's different areas, because people don't realize, because some people have backgrounds in, in deaf culture and the deaf community, and some people don't. So you have to decide as to what would you, because it's not just about the sign language itself. Because, I mean, you can see me signing now, right? So you're kind of saying to yourself, well, what is that? <laughs> but it's not just the hands, because often people think it's just a, a manual language, but it's the, which it is, of course, but also it's the facial expressions, and people concentrate often just on the hands and forget about everything else. So they're just thinking, where, what, are they, what are they doing with their hands all over the place? But really, it's, it's the whole, it encompasses everything. And, it's, and as I say, it's not just focusing on the hand, but the grammar also is encompassed in the facial expressions and how you use all the mannerisms on the face. So, for example, this is a sign for you, like a, a pronoun. And I know in others, in spoken languages, often you don't point because it's quite rude. But in sign languages, it's part of the grammar. So like for myself, when you're pointing, it's I, you, and you as in plural. So there, there's no get, way getting around it. You, it's what you have to do. You have to point. So this is part of the linguistics of ISL. Then likewise, when you're using your face with your eyebrows, if your eyebrows are raised, it's actually, you're actually asking a question. So that's why we have to have the hair out of, the, um, out of your eye, eyes, because if we cannot see your eyebrows, we don't know if you're asking a question or not. So it's very important to have your face, to, to be able to see your face. I mean, I, there's loads of examples I can give you, of course. But as I say, how you use your eyes, your cheeks, your, you know, how you move your body, your head, and so on. These are all the linguistic features, are, are part of the linguistic features of ISL. Like, for example, if you want to ask a person, would you like a cup of tea? Your eyebrows must be raised so that the person knows you're asking a question. So you point, would you, you know, would you like a cup of tea? So the direct translation would be, you, you like tea, so I'm with the eyebrow raised then. And of course, the person would respond, well, yes or no. It's an obvious kind of answer. But when people, when they're learning signs, they're focused so much perhaps on their hands that they forget about their facial expressions or they have their, their eyebrows furrowed, so more down, and they're saying, would you like tea? And it's not, it looks like if a person's been asked that question, they look like, um, I don't think I do, actually, because of the manner in which they're asking. It's not a particularly friendly manner. So in that sense, the, the, the meaning or the, the manner in which the question is being asked depends on the face. So see, when, you're, when you can ask, would you like a cup of tea, the, your eyebrows raise. It's a much more friendly manner. But when it, your, your facial expressions are more furrowed, um, it, it looks like you're more of a, a, an archy kind of a face. You're asking a question in a different tone of manner. Is that clear? Just you can nod and tell me if you're happy and understand what I'm saying. <coughs> so what you'll have to do, you'll have plenty of practice on how to use your facial expressions. It'd be like it'd be like going to the gym. You'll be able to do lots of exercises on your face, whereas before you'll have a very plain face. But after a while, you'd be like a robot before, you see. But now we'll have to um, get you to practice how to use your facial expressions more and more. And of course, your facial expressions are used as intensifiers. So in other words, how maybe happy you are about something, how sad. So they are grammatical markers. I think that particular slide we've more or less mentioned, so there's no need to go through that again. Actually, maybe there's one thing I should mention. As I mentioned, it's a four-year degree, so when people go into the first two years, everyone is, is, um, is learning the same things in the first two years. So it's a general deaf studies. And then, as I say, it's when in the third year, year that people start to spe go into their special specialities, so as to whether it's interpreting, in teaching or deaf studies, depending on results, of course, at that time, you need over 50% overall, 
to be able to pass into these different strands. And that's and particularly in ISL, it's over 50% that that you will need that if you need, if you want to to break into the strand of ISL teaching or interpreting. So that's important to, to make note of. So and and also the op there is the option that if you study for two years, and that perhaps you you are unable to go on to to the third and fourth year well then you can actually finish with a diploma in general deaf studies after two years. So maybe if you want to take a break for a while and then you may come back and start as a third year, perhaps a, a year or so later. You can do, that is also an option that you have. I mentioned the first two years. Here are some of the modules actually for my slides there, that the, the modules that are taught in the first two years. So we've got an introduction to sign linguistics. Basically, it's, it's, going, it's going into more detail as to the, the workings of ISL. Like, as I mentioned, how the grammatical features are in the face um, and in hand shapes and so on. Then there's social linguistics. That's really more goes into detail about variation um, in, in sign language in ISL, such as gender, you know, gender variation, gay, lesbian signs, and so on. And how sign has changed through the years. For example, older people, older deaf people would have signed the phone, like this is our sign for phone now. But now, or, or, or would have been that way, but now actually it's more like a mobile shape our hand, our hand shape has changed. It's only a simple example, of course. Whereas before, we would have used like a landline sign, which is the, the sign that Pat's using at the moment. And of course, before that, we would have used the phone, which is very old. That was, a, that was ages ago, of course. But if you see older deaf people, some perhaps, I mean, there's less and less people now, but you'll see that some still use that sign. And so, how, and of course, we do a lot of texting as well nowadays. So of course, this is used for texting. So the thing is, as technology changes, then the sign language changes to, to match that. Perhaps in the future, you never know how things may change as well, again, in these areas. We have a perspective on deafness as well, and that speaks about deaf culture and all these aspects. Then we've got language, language acquisition and deafness. So when a child is born, how they acquire that language, what age is good, and so on. Because you know we acquire sign lang or spoken language, but then is sign language the same? So that goes into all that details. And now, of course, there's a lot of research in this area. We've got the interactive discourse analysis. This is more like a broad curriculum module that we have. Because you will find as well with our, our course, we have, we're just off campus here on Leinster Street. So you'll study a lot of stuff in the Center for Deaf Studies, and then some here actually on campus as well. And this is one of the modules that, that will be offered here on the campus. Then we've got deaf education, and how that has changed through the years as well. How the theory of oralism was used, and then how sign language is used in the schools, and the, you know, the, the pros and cons of that. Then working with the deaf community, this is also a module that will be studied in the first two years. And of course, ethics. So if you want to be, you know, if you're trained to become a professional, we have got a, like a general ethics. And of course, as people are breaking into their different strands, then they have their own individual ethics, such as for interpreters, you know, ISL teaching and, and, and so on. So, and, and in those ethics is confidentiality, neutrality. For example, if, if maybe you're in court, and if you want an interpreter in the courts. So sometimes people pretend, you bring friends or family with them and use as interpreters, and they, they use these people as interpreters. But really, that's more of a communication support because obviously they don't have that code of ethics. It's just because they have a, a particular language. It's the same whether we're speaking about spo uh, spoken language or sign language. People like this that are used as communication supporters, if, if their information is wrong and so on, 
they don't have this code of ethics and so and then as to as regards neutrality well then of course that would be called into question as well whereas if you have a professional and qualified interpreter and you book through an agency well then of course the interpreters would have the confidentiality the neutrality and so on so it's it's very clear as to the the difference in in interpreters and communication supporters So as I say, when people break in to their different strands, such as the ISL, teaching the interpreters. So with the interpreters, they start with consecutive interpreting is one of their first modules that they do, that they study, liaison interpreting, and then simultaneous interpreting, which of course you see in action at the moment. Obviously there is, as I mentioned, a bit of a lag time, but it is simultaneous interpreting. So it's, it's, it's conducted at the same time. I sign and the interpreter speaks. For example, say if we're speaking of a spoken language, if, you, if you're speaking French, then somebody, because it's spoken, obviously, then the person would have to stop, and then the interpreter would speak. So that would be more what you refer to as consecutive interpreting. So someone signs or someone speaks, and then they stop, and then the interpreter speaks, which was used in sign language as well. And it depends on the areas. It is used in certain settings, because perhaps for some particular information has to be really concentrated on it the consecutive interpreting is used whereas with simultaneous as you see in action now it's used in circumstances like this and of course it's it's you study as to how work to work with interpreters and so on as well when people go into the ISL teaching strand we have you know the uh, Curriculum planning is, is, is one of the modules taught, teaching methods, theories of education, methods of assessments, so how to assess the, their future students. So we have the ISL teaching for the national curriculum, teaching as a, ISL as a first language, second language, and so on. Sure. Then people who are going into the general deaf study strands will be studying um, the modules deaf people and the media you know such as because obviously if they're dealing with media then they need to know the different aspects such as you know the newspapers and so on so multimedia is also studied and they have some options within those and they have a, a, a thesis for on research methods so they study the modules and then they have a, th a thesis at the same time during that. I'm not, obviously I'm just going very, just giving you a very brief synopsis of all the different strands here. I did kind of mention this earlier, but just to go through, if you want to have a quick read of that, as to the career opportunities are open to people who are doing the courses. You know, perhaps that you might be coming into the course and you, you have some experience in, in a particular area. And then if you study our course, well then of course that particular area can also be worked in conjunction with what you're studying for the future. Because of course, obviously we cannot teach you everything it, it, that, you know, in the language. Sure, it's impossible. You cannot teach all areas of, such as medicine, legal and so on. So if you have experience in these areas then, obviously then you can work in conjunction with what you're learning on our course. Some people like just to make perhaps more, go into more in depth in research, which, which they can do. They more of an academic setting. Some people would like to work with deaf children and de with deaf organizations. So these are all options that are open. So these are things that you need to think about before you apply for the course. So think about what, what, what areas would I like to work in? What would I like to achieve? What areas would I particularly like to, to you know, to, to, for yourself to, to have self-satisfaction? Some people come to the course, but they feel that they're benefiting because maybe they have members of their family that are deaf, and so they don't have a particular career opportunity in mind, but they just want to have that you know, that communication with their own family, particularly if they have children who are deaf. And then some people enter the course 
just for career opportunities. So people have their own reasons for entering into the course. Okay, so just is there any questions from the floor? Yes? Really, it's more TCD, like Trinity College itself, the admissions office that you need to probably speak to about that, because obviously it's, it's not with our, our department, the Centre for Deaf Studies, that would decide, make those decisions. But there are, if, if some, there are different ways. There is a program called DARE, and they have a way that you need less points for this. It's if there's some disability in some way, disability as, a, as regards, uh, you know, anything. Um, they, these are different, area, are different ways of applying I think it's about um, oh sorry, I just interpreter was just clarifying there. I was saying that last year like there was eighty seven people that wanted to study that that applied for the course last year, so obviously, as I was saying, it's quite limited spaces, so there's only twenty people that can actually physically get into the course. But obviously, if people have the points in there, they tend to be offered the places first. But then there is like a second round. And then if things don't work out or for people pull out of that, then they go to the, you know, the, like a waiting list for that. So. Well, there are different things that you can do for studying beforehand. You can study, like you say, something similar, maybe it's a PLC for extra, and then you can, that would mean extra points as well. And then after a year, then you could perhaps come in through the TCD. But you can apply and see uh, how you get on. And, and if people are determined, you know, if they, if they see that perhaps they've applied a couple of times, well, then sometimes people can, if people have that motivation, there, there can be somehow um, entry, you know, depending on the circumstances. But obviously, unfortunately, I can't decide those things. It's through the admissions office that maybe you need to just double check with things like that, if that's OK. Great, thank you. I know sometimes you feel the points are not so much fair because people are disappointed. I think it's th before it was 335, and the last year was 350, and now it's 385. So um, you know, as I say, he, the point system just keeps going up. So sorry about that. Any other questions? Yourself? Well, generally, with the social work, it means you focus on deaf people then when you're working in that area. Because obviously, uh, social work then, in general, you'd be working in all different areas. But if you study something like this, well, then you'd, the focus would be on deaf people. So basically, it means that you can actually communicate with deaf people when you're meeting your clients. Because most social workers don't have a communication with the deaf people, so it, it's, it can be quite difficult. So if you have sign language then in that sense, well then obviously you would be specialist in that, you know, you would specialize in that area in the sense of that you'd be able to communicate with deaf people, which is more than the majority of social workers would be able to do. Another question? Are you signing ASL there? Sorry, if you don't mind, I'll have to, you'll have to voice because the interpreter can't see. You. So go ahead. Are you deaf? Sorry? No, okay. Okay, would you mind? I'm sorry, because it's just, would you mind speaking and then the interpreter can, can sign for me? In the course? No. No, not in here. It's to study ASL, you would have to be in America. Not here, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. I know we do have some like ex foreign students coming here to study, and they might have, um, you know, they, they'll study, we'll study ISL and then maybe go back to America and study ASL, but we don't study it in our course. It's just Irish Sign Language. Sorry, another question there. Um, 
through both actually. The first two years, a lot of the majority are done through English, and then after the two years, then uh, you'll find there's mo most of the modules are through ISL. But of course, there is interpreters there. Like, if, for example, if I'm teaching, well, then there will be an interpreter there to tr to translate what has been said, and then likewise. Um, you know, so there's always there's access to both languages. We always ensure that there's access to both. So I'm afraid we have time. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming to my lecture. If you're on your we have our stand over in the old dining hall. So if you want any more information, all we can head over there now if you wish. All right. Mm -hmm.